Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to our um, AMSA event, Is God Dead? Um, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Student Association um, is part of UCL Union, and we normally hold um, discussions and debates um, about various different topics associated with Islam. And um, now today's event, um, we have um, two speakers. One is a final year medic student, um, Dai Nasser, and um, another scholar, uh, okay. Um, before we start, um, we would like to introduce you to our Ahmadiyya Muslim Research Association. Um, the chairman, um, Naveed Malik, um, who will introduce um, you to the Research, research Association. Um, could I ask um, Naveed Malik to introduce the Ahmadiyya Muslim Research Association? Uh, thank you, Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. be upon you all. Uh, so, my name is Navi Malik, and uh, uh, I coordinate the activities of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Research Association. Um, ponder the earth, look upon the stars, go to the mountains and study how great they are. Study the mosquito and things even smaller. Study how the earth shakes. Ponder over how the universe expands. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the words, I paraphrase, but these are the words of the Holy Quran. Ponder, look, understand, use your reason. Again and again and again, there is an immense emphasis upon studying the nature, the work of God, uh, as the Holy Quran would put it around us, and doing science. This is a call to research. This is the call to science. And this is the same call which was heard by Archimedes of Syracuse, same call which was heard by Newton of England, same call which was heard by Feynman of Caltech, same call which was heard by Abdus Salam of Imperial College. And it's the same call which we endeavor to, to respond to at the Ahmadiyya Muslim Research Association. So we exist to, for two primary purposes. One is to bring our youth, the youth of our community, towards science and research, uh, to encourage them towards um, questioning the world around them, and towards forming a better understanding of the world around them, and towards uh, developing, finding new things, uh, to inspire them towards discovery. Um, the second uh, purpose for which we exist is to break this myth that religion, belief in God, is an antithesis to, uh, to science and research and rationality. We believe that both of them actually are parts of the same thing. They are, as if, two sides of the same point. They correlate. They must correlate. And the position we take is that science is the work of God and um, religion and scripture is the word of God. And today, I think uh, this, the event is pretty much, very much about that as well. And how we achieve these activities is by having different kinds of events. Um, so we support events like this um, with UCL AMSA. Uh, we also organize regular research cafes where people have where people come in an informal environment and they discuss different ideas um, uh, about. Uh, ideas about pure science, the new developments in science, and also about the interface between science and religion. Um, we also organize outreach activities, so we take our young youth of our community to, to uh, the top universities in the UK and show them around and show them how research is done and how academia works. And we also have an astronomy club, so we have a four-inch uh, telescope uh, with which we re organize regular uh, stargazing sessions. We're able to see Jupiter, its moons, 
and we we are able to see the moon at, at the craters and the craters within the craters of the moon, uh, and we are also able to see Saturn and its rings. So uh, it's a call towards um, studying the works of God. It's in which we think as synonymous as science, or rather too synonymous, to, um, as synonymous to science. Uh, to end, I will um, uh, read out a quote from Feynman, which I think applies. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, he's considered one of the great physicists of the last uh, century. Um, and I think it applies very well to today's meeting, so I'll end with that. In this age of specialization, men who thoroughly know one field are often incompetent to discuss another. The great problems of the relations between one and another, uh, between one and another aspect of human activity have for this reason been discussed less and less in public. When we look at the past great debates on these subjects, we feel jealous of those times, for we should have liked the excitement of such argument. The old problems, such as the relation of science and religion, are still with us, and I believe present, us, present <clears throat> as difficult dilemmas as ever. But they are not often publicly discussed because of the limitations of specialization. So let's discuss them today in today's event. Thank you very much for listening. It should work. Is it kind of really heavy? I'm not so special yet. Yet. Um, my name is Dr. Nasser and I'm a, a final year medical student here at University College London. Um, and I'm the president of the Academy of Muslim Students Association. And today um, I'll be talking on this particular topic, Is God Dead? And obviously the thing that brought you to the event was the fantastic poster, because that's basically how we look at it. It's really good actually. Um, and I don't know who came up with the title. Um, but I, I think it's an important title because it kind of um, it's an important title because it summarizes two particular key questions um, that I want to address today. So let's begin. So the first question is brought up by Is God Dead? Is was he ever alive? Did God does God exist? In short. Um, the next part of it is God dead, in, implies has God ceased to exist, or what are the signs of life that we see in God today? Um, so I will be discussing this in relation to three particular aspects. Firstly, is the question of God existing even necessary? Why do we even bother thinking about it? Um, what is its relationship to our present day knowledge of the universe? Secondly, what does the universe tell us about God? Naturally, if you were to make something, the, the creation of something should bear the stamp of the creator. A painter who paints a painting leaves a, leaves a mark of himself on it. And the person who writes a piece of literature leaves a, a bit of himself in the book. And it reflects that. So similarly, if, if the universe is the creation of God, then does the universe tell us anything about God? Or does it indicate that God actually did indeed create it? Or there is a concept of a theistic God? The third thing is, how can we know that God actually exists? The first two issues, is God necessary, what does the universe tell us about God, they take us to the position whereby we might be able to see, say that God should exist. But the question is, how do we move from that should to is? And what is the type of evidence that will lead us to confirming that um, knowledge rather than belief? I'm using a pointer. Um, the first issue, is God necessary? Um, we can actually deduce this also from the nature of the universe. And this is, a, this is a quite an old argument, it's called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. And it was originated with the Holy Quran, it's an argument of the Holy Quran which says, um, Surely to thy Lord do all things go. Prior philosophers had also talked about it as well. Um, and it was popularized by an individual called Imam al-Ghazali in his book, uh, The Incoherence of Philosophers. Um, and it goes something like this, it's that everything in this universe is bound up in a chain of cause and effect. Every single effect is subsequently another cause of another effect. Now, in a finite world of cause and effect, you have to go back to, you cannot have an infinite uh, chain of cause and effect. The reason for this is something called infinite regression. If you had, a, if you had a, an infinite chain of cause and effect, you would never have reached the present moment because you would continually be uh, flying on the wings of that infinity. Um, so you would never reach the present moment. And so the concept of the present moment and the concept of cause and effect that exists in this universe today necessitates an uncaused cause. 
Now we can go into the question and answer session at length about is the, it, would, um, would this apply, for example, the universe was eternal and such issues, which I welcome anybody to do and it will be a great discussion. I'm not a physicist, although we do have physicists in the house, but I do have a working knowledge of the topic. Um, in point of fact, the concept of an eternal beginning <coughs> occurring or being necessary is admitted now and is becoming more widespread. The only question is, what is the nature of that eternal beginning? Is it something which is a machine-like thing, a universe-producing machine? Is it a theistic concept of a personal god? So this is, a, this is an individual called Lawrence Krauss, many of you may know him. Um, he wrote a book fairly recently called The Universe from Nothing. And everybody picked up the book and they thought, wow, you know, we're going to learn how the universe actually came from nothing. But unfortunately, the term nothing he used was, is a bit of a deception. And a lot of philosophers, especially one in the New York Times, um, gave him a scathing review because he used the term nothing uh, to basically mean something. He used the term nothing to mean the matter around us, but prior to the matter around us, there was still something. And that something were, was the laws of quantum mechanics. So he said that the laws of quantum mechanics existed prior to the universe. And the laws of quantum mechanics create different field states in which you get these quantum vacuums from which the different universes with different universal constants come into and out of existence. So putting all that jargon aside, what he basically meant said was there's a set of laws that preceded the universe and they are eternal. But they're not personal, they don't care about you, they have no intention, it's like a machine which is churning you out. So, but the thing about this is, which is very, very noteworthy, is that even the most hardened atheistic cosmologists now today accept that there has to, in some form, be something which is eternal. Some believe that it's an eternal beginning prior to the existence of the Big Bang. Some believe in actual fact that the Big Bang and the entire universe is in a state of eternity itself, which is, again, something which is more along the lines of philosophy. And cosmology and philosophy do sometimes intersect like that. So let's do a quick summary of where we've got so far. Where we've got so far is that we have got something which is eternal. We've got something which in the theistic notion of the attributes of God is known as omnipresence. Something has to be always there. It's a necessity for every other being that exists. Every other being depends upon other things. I did not exist at one point. My father and my mother came together and I came into being. My being is dependent and contingent upon other factors. And for that to continue to be so, it is necessary that there is something upon which everything is contingent. And that is that omnipresent thing. So the question, however, is, before we get onto the issue of God, you notice that I haven't mentioned God yet. I haven't mentioned that I haven't quoted from Scripture. I'm trying to build up the case in, on a kind of purely from a, uh, a rational standpoint in the sense of not deriving from an authority in a particular belief. So what about omniscience and omnipotence? Because omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence are kind of three of the hallmarks of God. And is this force, being, or law a conscious entity, or is it unconscious? Is it just like a machine that precedes the universe and is an eternal machine? Is it, in short, the concept of a deistic God as opposed to a theistic? The difference being one of involvement in human personal affairs. So the question is, what do the universe's laws tell us? Let's put that to one side. We've got the omnipresence of God. Um, so what do the universe's laws tell us? The universe's laws tell us, in actual fact, that the universe is beautifully fine-tuned for life. Now, this in itself was appealed to me very, very strongly when I was started to research into this, and I was shocked to learn the degree to which science has uncovered the fine-tuning of the universe. Just to take a few constants, um, for example, the expansion rate of the universe. If the expand and this is the maximum deviation away from the value that it exists in, would result in complete, uh, wouldn't have resulted in a life-giving universe. So for example, 1 over 10 to the power of 18, which is known as a quintillion, that is the maximum deviation allowable for the universe, um, for the expansion rate of the Big Bang. Had it been that much more than it was, it would have resulted in a universe which would have exploded so quickly that no matter would have coalesced to form galaxies, to form stars, we'd have no heart heavier elements. If it was that much smaller, it would have resulted in uh, the collapse of the universe, and nothing would have expanded subsequently. And this doesn't just go for one particular universal constant, it goes for a lot of universal constants. In fact, this is a, this is a handful, it's a cherry-picked selection. Um, the one that's really got physicists going, actually, is something called the cosmological constant, and I have a YouTube clip here I'd like to play you. Unfortunately, 
completely forgot to uh, load it up prior to. Oh, so I'm just going to do that quickly. Or maybe, maybe I can play it. At the, I'll play it at the beginning. It's no problem. Um, but oh. so I'll, I can play it at the beginning. The, the noteworthy point about the cosmological constant is that it is one over ten to the power of one hundred and twenty. So imagine something which is finely tuned to 1 over 10 with 120 zeros over it. So to give you an idea, obviously a million is 1 with 6 zeros after it. A billion is 1 over 9. Well, it depends with whether you're American or English. And so and so forth. This is 1 with over, 1 over 10 to the power of 120. And that's something that determines the, the density of a vacuum, of space, effectively, and determines that the universe continues to expand. Um, so these constants, I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. We have to remember the probability of the life-giving universe we exist currently isn't just the biggest one. It's actually this multiplied by this, multiplied by this, multiplied by this. And every single universal constant has to be multiplied together, and then that is the value of the probability that this universe would have existed by chance. Now, the thing about this is there's such a powerful argument that cosmologists themselves, both atheistic and theistic, you either have to believe in the concept of a designer or, a, or an intelligence behind this, or you believe in something else. And that something else has kind of come and crept into cosmological notions. And you may have heard of it. It's called the multiverse. So the multiverse, oh, before I get on to that, this is just a, an, another few examples of that process. So. This is about the entropy level of the universe, the expansion rate of the universe, and the strong nuclear force constant. Um, a note on entropy before we move on to the multiverse, which is something which preceded, which is over here. Entropy is the measure of order or disorder in the universe. So this is particularly important because it kind of relates to the concept of our universe being eternal, which is something that is hypothesized and um, among some cosmologists. And this is a man by the name of Mirza Dahir Ahmed, who wrote a fantastic book called Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge and Truth, which you may be able to find at the back. And in that, there's a chapter called Entropy in the Finite Universe. Um, what he presented was not his own original argument, but it's a well-summarized argument for a lay reader. And it's effectively this, that if I was to take a, a cup of tea and put it in a cold room, over time, the tea would, uh, the energy, the heat energy, at the beginning, it would just be the cold room and the, and the heat from the cup. Over time, the heat would dissipate throughout the room, and the entire room and the cup would reach a heat equilibrium. Now, this, is, this spread of energy from a focal point into its surroundings is known as the process of entropy, or the entropy is increasing. So, for example, as stars burn, they release energy. And in actual fact, every single body that contains heat energy releases energy and is equilibrating with its surroundings. So this would result effectively, if this was an eternal process, and if the universe was eternal in some form, even prior to the Big Bang in the form of another universe or in the form of other creations, what you would have effectively at this present moment, you would have an extraordinarily high entropy. In actual fact, you wouldn't have any chemical reactions ever happening at all. It would be what's known as the heat death of the universe, because all matter and all heat energy would be spread evenly across space. And so you'd have no coalescing of heat energy, which would enable chemical reactions, which would enable hydrogen to be converted into helium in the sun, and so on and so forth. So this is a very powerful argument that is used against the concept that the universe is eternal. What this actually necessitates is that prior to the existence of this universe, if there were preceding universes in a cyclical fashion, between each universe, it would require for the entropy level to be reset by an external source, which is in itself <coughs> not subject to disorder and not subject to the law of entropy. We can talk about this at length afterwards as well. Um, I know these are kind of, I'm, I'm, I, I, I get the feeling I'm perhaps rushing through and maybe I should slow down a little. But this is the next aspect. It's called the multiverse. Now, the fine-tuning of the universe is so beautifully fine-tuned that cosmolo cosmologists who don't want to believe in the existence of God, they kind of come up with this idea that, well, let's hypothesize that there's an infinite number of universes. It's called the multiverse. Literally an infinite number. And in these infinite number of universes, all of the parameters of 
um, the cosmological constant, the, 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 the figure that defines entropy levels, the uh, expansion rate of the universe, all these natural constants are different. And so some universes collapse, some of result in a heat death. And out of all of these universes, we happen to be in the one which is perfectly fine-tuned for life. And the only reason we're asking the question as to whether God created the universe is because we are the lucky few. We are the ones who actually resulted in life. And so it's a retrospective bias. It's called the anthropic principle, which is the, an the an, the, the anthropic, the man, the human, is only asking this question because he existed in the first place. So this is actually a, a very strange argument because what it shows you is actually the strength of the fine-tuning argument. It shows that the fine-tuning argument is so strong that to believe in the current existing state of the universe, you either have to believe in an intelligent designer who is one uncaused hypothesis, or you have to believe in a hypothesis relating to an infinite number of uncaused universes. Now, Occam's razor, which is one of the principles of science, which is that the simplest answer tends to be the correct one, is something that scientists often adhere to. And in this particular case, you have the decision, you have the choice. Observing the universe, do you believe in one uncaused being or an infinite number of uncaused existences? The, the fallacy of it also is that, actually, it's an arbitrary argument. If, for example, I said to you that 10% of those universes in these millions of them or infinite number of them, if 10%, if let's say, or a large number of them had life in them, would that make a cosmological atheist believe in God? The answer is no. They would say, well, if there really was a God, the other 90% should have life in them as well. And if all 100%, if we were to somehow find out if all 100% of the universe in the multiverse had, had life in them, then they would say that there isn't one multiverse, there is an infinite number of multiverses. And our multiverse happens to be the one in which you have uh, all of the natural constants all perfectly fixed, and the others don't, aren't. But we haven't yet been able to find those multiverses. It's just an inflation of uh, a kind of um, an excuse, really, not to face up to the facts which we see in nature. The final thing is that there's no observable evidence for it. And so, in actual fact, you have a choice. You can believe in the concept of one unobserved designer or an infinite number of unobserved universes. So again, I'm just going to quickly summarize because I don't want to get us all lost here. What we've established is that omnipresence, something which is eternal, has to be the basis of all things which result in cause and effect. We've established that there has to be something which certainly knew how to produce a universe, whether it be through random throwing of an infinite number of dices, or whether it be through producing a universe individually which had perfect constants for life. It has to be omniscient, it has to be all-knowing. As result, uh, to, uh, in relation to that which will produce life. And it also has to have the capability to produce a universe, because at the end of the day, I'm standing here talking to you and you're talk sitting there listening to me. So we are existing. So how did this come to be? But the question is, if this thing is omnipotent, omnip omniscient, and omnipresent, then how do we know that it's conscious? How do we know that it's not just a universe-producing machine? And how do we know that all the religion isn't all a bunch of hokey pokey in which we're all just addressing ourselves, really? I just wanted to say hokey pokey, to be honest. Um, so, is the creative power conscious or not? So, there are two aspects to look at this as well. There's a philosophical aspect to it, and then there's what we might call the experimental argument. The philosophical one tells us that a creator should be conscious. Whereas the experimental one tells us an actual fact that the, that the creator is indeed conscious and that we can interact with him. Or it, when I use the male gender, I don't mean God is actually a man with a beard. I mean that you know that the constraints of our language result in a gender being fixed to an individual. The first one, which is the philosophical argument, is that we are conscious. And this is a very fine and subtle point that I'm raising. What I'm saying is that we know that the creator, or whatever preceded us, must be conscious because necessarily the attributes of a product must be related to the ingredients which preceded it. If you try and make a cake, for example, with none of the ingredients capable of being sweet themselves or producing sweetness, your cake is not going to be sweet, no matter how many other ingredients you put in it. You have to have the capability of the individual particles themselves being sweet or having the capability to produce sweetness. Similarly, 
you're not going to get a thoroughbred racehorse from a fat pony. It's not going to happen, okay? Because the ingredients in the original are not there for it to be in the product. So this is more of a philosophical argument that whatever preceded the universe and was that eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent thing must have had the capability to produce something which in itself, which was reflected in itself, in a sense, and how it was part of its own attributes. But this is kind of telling us that God should be conscious, or that creative power should be conscious. It doesn't really inspire the heart. It doesn't really lead us to locking ourselves in a closet and beseeching God to reveal himself to us. It's a kind of murky kind of feeling or a thought, which is nice to contemplate. So how do we get onto that particular stage? There's some, I'm a medical student, so when you see, for example, uh, a person lying in the street, you, the first thing you're taught, apart from look for danger, right? The first thing you're taught as a first aider is you approach it and you shout and you shake. Okay, it's called shout and shake. You shout in the ear, you go, hello, hello, can you hear me, can you hear me? And if the guy goes, yeah, all right, I'm just taking a rest on the floor, what are you doing? He's not facing me, okay? Then you know he's awake. If, for example, the person doesn't speak back, but they, you say to them, blink twice, and they blink twice. You say, blink five times, and then stick out your tongue, and they go, right? You know that there's a high degree of improbability that that would have happened at the same time as you saying that, and that in a way is a sign that that person is there. Now, I'm not saying in any way that God is like a, like a dead body, in fact, I will come back to this, that God is very much not a dead body, and in fact, God manifests himself, and it is not entirely dependent upon you. Uh, God manifests himself, but it, it requires your effort as well, which is what we're going to come to as well. Now, the first thing you can do is, you can talk to something. You can talk to something, and you see if they talk back. Now, that's what prayer is, fundamentally. That is what prayer is. It's talking to, some, talking to God, and seeing if he's going to talk back. And that is the rational basis for prayer, fundamentally. The as other aspect of it is that somebody else talks to that being, or to that person who is hypothesized to be conscious, and that person gets a reply, and he tells you what that person said. So this is, for example, belief in the prophets of God, or belief in the saints of God, who pray to God, receive a response, and then tell you that God told me this, I had this particular revelation. So that is fundamentally also one aspect of acquiring certainty in regard to it. But the question also still remains, um, which is, how do we know that they're talking the truth? It's one thing if God speaks to you and says, Daher, I am, my name's Daher. Um, and I know, therefore, that God exists. But it's another thing if somebody comes up to me and says, well, God's spoken to me. And then you might, in today's skeptical world, might say, well, I'm sorry, that's just I don't, you know, I think you're schizophrenic, I, you know, whatever it may be. But the question is, how can you be sure about that? Now, the first thing to know is, how do we know what we know about anything? Let's generalize first before we start talking about God. How do we know, for example, how many people drive in this audience? You put up your hand, how many people do you drive? Okay, so a fair number. Now, how many of you, Alan, who drove, okay, how many of you know the inner workings of your car? No, seriously. <laughs> okay, so we've got one guy at the front. I, you know, well, help me out. Okay, we've got one guy at the front. The vast majority of people, including me, who drive, we don't know how the inner workings of our car. When we take it for an MOT, we take it to the mechanic and he does it. Fundamentally, driving away from the mechanic, you don't know if the car's going to blow up or not. You didn't observe the car. Now, that's just for your car. How do you know what happened in history prior to your birth? How do you know what happened with the decline of the Roman civilization? Or with, or with anything in history, fundamentally, is eyewitness account on the basis of testimony. That is the entire basis of, our, of the entire uh, knowledge of history, in actual fact, is on the basis of testimony. In the courts of law, also, you have testimony. Witnesses are called and cross-examined. How do you know what you're told in the university is correct? I'm a medical student. If I had to verify the position of every single nerve that I've memorized, it would result in a lot of bodies in my closet, I tell you. I've had to have dissect a huge number of bodies to result in knowing where each, each nerve is. The fact is I just memorized it and regurgitated it on the basis of other people's knowledge. Now this is a very interesting one, how the Earth goes around the Sun. Now, the Earth, when, how do we know the Earth goes around the Sun, really? In fact, the Earth going around the Sun is actually contrary to our own observation. Our own observation of it is that the Sun goes around the Earth. Because we don't see the Earth moving. From our perspective, it's the Sun that's moving. And yet, there's scarcely a human being on Earth today who believes that the, earth goes, that the Sun goes around the Earth. 
Yeah, that's right. That the sun goes around the earth. <laughs> we all believe that the earth goes around the sun. And why is that? In this particular case, our argument and belief in testimony <coughs> actually trumps our belief in our own observable witness. And the final thing is, which is a bit rude, but how do you know who your father is? <laughs> Fundamentally, it's only on the testimony of your mother, actually. And there is not a single man on earth who actually knows that his child, as a fact, is his, unless he takes a DNA test, which most people have never done. Because he goes on the testimony of his wife, or his girlfriend, or so on and so forth. So, not even 99%. A lot more than 99% of our knowledge of the universe is based on testimony. Now, what people say, tend to say from this point is, well, they say, okay, well, that's fine, but I can verify who my father is, I can take a turn to test. I can take a mathematics degree and figure out the actual maths individually as to how the uh, sun goes around the earth. Oh, it goes around the sun, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I can learn, I can go through some of the things. In history, that's one thing I can get you on. You're never going to be able to find out what happened in history. And you can take a, you know, a degree in mechanics or whatever. But how do I find out if God exists individually? And this is something that was popularized by Carl Sagan on the right and Marcelo Trizzi. He said that, and it's, it's said so much by Professor Dawkins these days and other uh, uh, atheists like Lawrence Krauss, Pro Professor Dawkins and Sam Harris. They say extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Now the problem with this actually is, that that's completely relative. Extraordinary is a meaningless term. It's completely, it's completely relative. And the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Mirzabullah Ahmad, may peace and blessings of God be upon him, he, I also wanted to play you this YouTube, actually no, I really do want to play you this YouTube, it's beautiful actually. It's a really beautiful um, YouTube clip to play. It's a bit of nature for us. Um. Can you see it? century in a landlocked middle of Europe and you'd never been near a lake really and you'd never seen flying fish. I don't think you'd find flying fish actually in the lake, you'd only find them in the oceans possibly. You wouldn't have believed this. Now when I, I went to Tanzania when I um, was 19 years old and I remember being on a boat in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I'd never heard of flying fish in my life and I saw this shoal of fish <coughs> just flying for ages across the water. I thought are those birds? And then I saw them jump into the water. And then they, they popped up another 100 meters or so somewhere else, and they flew again. And the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, peace be upon him, said that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, he said, if nobody had told you that flying fish existed, and you'd never, you'd never seen any flying fish, and then somebody told you these fish exist that fly for 200 meters, he said you wouldn't believe it, would you? But they exist. And so the concept of extraordinary is a totally meaningless and relative term. If indeed the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for example, did receive revelation and his companions did receive revelation, 
If you had lived in their time, <coughs> revelation was a fairly ordinary experience. And it wouldn't have been extraordinary in the way that many people see it today. So the concept of God being an extraordinary concept is a meaningless phrase in actual fact. And therefore it doesn't require extraordinary proof. It requires the same amount of proof as you take for everything else. And the majority of things you take for proof is on the basis of testimony, first of all. But then there's also the question of extraordinary evidence. Now, as a believer in the Holy Quran, I'm naturally going to present verses of the Holy Quran because I believe that they, they speak to us in the modern day as well, and because this is a book for all times. And this is where I'm going to start presenting a few examples of testimony before then addressing the question as to how you individually can, in a way, get God to speak to you. You individually can get God to communicate with you, whereby your belief in testimony goes from belief to knowledge. So this particular verse is from chapter 21, verse 31 of the Quran, and says, Do not the disbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were a closed up mass, ratban, and then we opened them out, and from water did we create every living thing? Will they not then believe? Now the extraordinary verse, thing about this verse is that it's, the word ratban has two principal meanings. It first of all means infusion into a single entity, and it also means total darkness. Now, this is very apt because this is quite clearly speaking about how the heavens and the earth were in a closed up bundle and were then released and opened out by God, which is exactly what we now know happened in the Big Bang. So, the context of this is that this was produced by a man who was a 7th century illiterate Arabian orphan. He had nobody to vouch for him, he, he, he couldn't read or write, and so the entire universe and all that it was contained in it was entirely limited to what he could see or observe with his own personal eyes or what he could hear from those around him at a time of pitch black darkness in human civilization and yet this is the principal means by which God speaks about how the universe came into being in the Quran and it just happens to so be absolutely correct the claim that water is the basis from, of all life and from water we made every living thing is very much resounds with us today. When we look for planets which could possibly support life, the first thing we look for is water on those planets, because we know water is a basis of life. And this is from 20th, 27th February 2014. There's Kepler Space Telescope's discoveries include four, four planets that could hold liquid surface water believed to be key for life. <coughs> it doesn't just relate to the Holy Quran, there are some which also relate even to what we may recall, regard as trivial phenomena today. So he was asked, the Prophet Muhammad was once asked, and it's recorded in Sahih Bukhari, which is the most authentic compilation of traditions or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, recorded approximately a hundred years after his death. And he was asked, when will the hour come, the hour signifying, um, uh, it signifies several things, which we can discuss later. But he answered, when the shepherds of black camel camels start boasting and competing with each other in the construction of taller buildings. In one particular narration of this in Imam Malik's Muwatta, he was asked, who were they? Who are they? And he said, the Arabs. And this is also recorded in a, in a very early compilation after his death. And this is exactly what we see today. The Arabs are the ones who are competing beyond and you know beyond all others for the construction of tall buildings. And this is one in Jeddah that I don't know if it's been uh, built yet. It's actually going to beat the Burj Khalifa. It's going to be a kilometer tall. Which is, you know, quite frankly, nothing on, uh, on Everest, which is nine miles, I think. Um, there is another one. I forgot to delete this slide, my apologies. He also spoke of future forms of transportation. And he, he said, he made a very clear prophecy, which is, the camel will be abandoned as a means of transport, and people will not look to it with this intent. And he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, how swift will be the jar, that nation in the latter days, um, travel? He said, as the cloud is carried by the wind, the earth will be rolled up for him. He will hold the cloud in his right hand and will overreach the sun at its place of setting. And the sea will be ankle deep for him. Before him will be a mountain of smoke. He further said that this donkey upon which the nation in the future would travel, because they, refer, they used to travel on donkeys, would eat fire, and yet the passengers who would be inside the belly of the donkey would not be harmed by the fire. And it would breathe smoke and travel over the distance of a month's journey that a camel would take in a day. So all of these indications are an extraordinary, if you think about it, for a 7th century illiterate orphan 
to come up with statements that there will one day be a time when the camel, which was vital and fundamental to Arabian civilization and culture, will be completely abandoned as a means of transport. And there'll be another thing, which is going to eat fire and travel extremely fast over water, land, sea, and air. The question, however, is, this is, that was 1,500 years ago, what testimony do we still have that God still speaks today? And this is the second part of my talk, which isn't actually halfway through, it's a bit over halfway through, so don't worry, I'm going to stop talking soon. Um, and it relates to the question of, does God still speak today? Now, this also is necessary for a belief in God fundamentally, because to believe in a God who just used to speak in the past but no longer addresses us today is the same as believing, in a way, in a God who has no concern for you, but had a concern for the people of previous ages. This is a quote from Mirza Walam Ahmed, who is the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He says, is it not true that an affirmation by the living God, I am present, bestows such a degree of understanding compared with which the self-conceived books of all the philosophers amount to nothing at all? What can these so-called philosophers who are themselves blind teach us? In short, if God Almighty desires to bestow perfect understanding upon his seekers, then he has certainly kept open the way of converse with him. So the claim of Mirza Ghulam Muhammad was to be the reformer of Islam as prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when Islam would degenerate and when Muslims would drift away from the true teachings of Islam, a reformer would be sent to them who through revelation would guide the Muslims to the correct interpretation of Islam. Now naturally, as any prophet comes, and he claimed to be a prophet within the body of Islam and not a law-bearing prophet, and we can also discuss that further if people would like, um, he came with, as always, all prophets claim to do, is prophecies, in the same way as the Prophet Muhammad came with those prophecies regarding future means of transportation and future changes in the world's architecture, in a way. He also came one, and there's one particular one I would like to finish my talk on, um, as a modern-day testimony that God still speaks, and it relates to World War I. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was born in 1935, and he died in 1908, and he made many prophecies. He wrote approximately 86 books. Um, or thereabouts, and he wrote one book in 1905, which is called Brahini Ahmadiyya, uh, Volume 5, in which he set out many prophecies, one of which was this. He made this prophecy in 1905, and it was multifaceted, had lots of aspects to it, and all aspects were fulfilled. There was a time limit to the prophecy that was stipulated as well, because it's one thing to just say that in the future something will happen, and uh, to be perfectly honest, and to just leave it open like that. But it's another thing to say something will happen, and that it being a particularly specific condition, and then set a time limit for when it will happen. And he died before it was fulfilled, so nobody can accuse him, let's say, of you know, after the event fiddling his own books. He died in 1908, and was buried in Qadiyan in India. And the references are all in English. You can find it in a book called Dazgara under the year 1905, or a book called Invitation to Ahmadiyyad under chapter 10, which was written in 1920s. So this is a poetic summary of parts of the revelation, or parts of the, of the calamity which was to befall the world. And I'm going to read it out for you. He said, A sign will appear some days from now which will devastate country, town, and meadow. So suddenly will people be seized with divine wrath. An undressed person will have no time to secure his loincloth. They shall all be suddenly shaken by this earthquake, be it men or trees or rocks or oceans. In the twinkling of an eye, the earth will be turned upside down, and blood will flow as in streams. <coughs> Those whose night garments were as, were as white as jasmine will wake up as if dyed as red. Men and animals will lose their senses, and pigeons and nightingales will forget their songs. And this is exactly what happened on the battlefields of the song, and was immortalized in a lot of the poetry of English poets, that pigeons lost their song. That hour will be hard upon every traveler, and every wayfarer will lose his way in agony. With the blood of the dead, mountain streams will become as red as red wine, and men on the high and low will be convulsed with fear. Even the Tsar, the Tsar of Russia, who was one of the greatest imperial emperors of the time, will be in a pitiable or wretched state. This sign will be an example of divine wrath, and heaven will attack with a drawn sword. So as I said, you can also find this in Essence of Islam, Volume 5, which is in English, page 151. So, there are several aspects of this. I'm going to quote the, the actual revelation that he set forth and the actual words of it. He wrote, The earth was turned upside down. I shall come to you suddenly with my armies. There are two aspects to this. First of all, the whole of the earth. Was the whole of the earth affected with World War I? In point of fact, prior to World War I, 
There had never been a worldwide calamity other than the meteor that finished off the dinosaurs. And in World War I was the first time you saw fighting on every single part of the globe, in Australia, in Africa, in South America, in America, in Far East with Japan, in with Europe. And did it happen suddenly? It did happen suddenly. In fact, out of all the wars that we know in modern day history, it occurred with the greatest suddenness. It occurred with the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And this is a photo of his arrest and capture immediately after the assassination. Another particular aspect of it was houses will disappear even as all thought of me has disappeared. You will see the earthquake of the appointed day. God will show you the earthquake of the appointed day. Dominion on that day will be for the one relentless God. It's a very powerful and a kind of wrathful expression to be used. And the parts of the world that were particularly affected was south of France, which was known as in the time was the most licentious and the most and the place where from which the vast majority of alcohol in the world was produced and sent to all parts of the globe. And it specifically says, houses will disappear as all thought of me has disappeared. So the places which were most given to forgetting God, they were the places most affected, unfortunately. <coughs> and if anybody's been to Flanders Field and to the battlefields of the Somme, as I have, it's a very moving place to be. Another aspect of it was in relation to the Jewish people. <coughs> One revelation of it was, we have saved Israel from detriment. So this is exactly what happened in the course of World War I in 1917 that under the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the, um, the, the concept of the State of Israel was drawn up. And this is something I, I'm not going to read for you. You can all find yourself. This is from the Times, 9th of November, 1917. And this is an extraordinary thing as well, because the Jewish people, unfortunately, had been, you know, they'd been a dispersed field for 2,000 years. And so to make a prophecy that it would result, this war would result in some benefit for the Jewish people, for Israel, who was, which was the name of Jacob, the progenitor of the Jewish people, is a very powerful thing as well. The most poignant, however, and the most powerful and the most extraordinary aspect of this prophecy related to the Tsar of Russia. And to read the story of the Tsar of Russia is an extremely <coughs> tragic one. Now I want you to imagine, I want you to take your image, eyes off the slides please and look at me, because I want you to picture it for me. I want you to imagine in 1905 a man in India making a claim, and a man who himself has hardly ventured out of his village half and for most of his life. I want you to imagine him making a claim regarding the most highest placed emperor of the time, other than Queen Victoria of the time. Or the Queen Elizabeth. Somebody correct me. It was Queen Victoria, my apologies. That's bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the point she, is. She died in 1901, so. 1901. Oh, okay. I, see, I knew it was something. Was it some kid, man? Was it George? It was George, perhaps. You have an accent, so you actually no. know British history. No, I'm not, <laughs> you, I'm not British. I'm she's British. not British, and he knows British history better than me. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for uh, pointing this out, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's a very poignant story, because imagine a man in India in 1905 saying, the Tsar of Russia, the one which literally means the one who rules over all and is ruled by none, he will be in a pitiable state. And he wrote a poem, and that poem, and actually I, didn't, I cropped it, I didn't finish it. It says at the end of it, it says, on this sign depends the fulfillment of my truth. And it says, hasten not to repudiate this argument. And this is exactly what happened to the Tsar. There are, in fact, attempts made to dethrone him, even in the early 1900s, while Mirza Allah Mahmoud was still alive. But as I will show you, he also said that he would be dead by that time. They were unsuccessful. What happened is... The Tsar was actually inspecting the front lines of his, of his force against the Germans on the east, on the, uh, you know, towards, towards Germany. And he was told that there was a revolution occurring in, in, in his, near his palace. He returned, hoping to quell it with a firm hand. But this time, the firm hand proved the opposite. And it resulted in the overtaking by the Bolshevik revolutionaries, who forced him to abdicate from his throne. And on the 15th of March, 1917, within, um, within the course of World War I, he was asked to sign an affidavit that neither he nor his family would ever take the throne above, on, upon the Russians again. And so the rule of the Romanov family was completely destroyed. However, for it to be, that wouldn't be a pitiable state just to be caused to abdicate. So what happened next? In March 1918, he was placed on soldiers' rations. They were living in a governor general's palace at the time quite comfortably. From then, he was then moved on to his own dungeons in which he used to imprison people. And there, the pitiable state really began. He was imprisoned, and there are even reports that Bolshevik guards raped his own daughter, while the Tsarina, his wife, was forced to watch, and they were starved to an extreme extent. And on the 17th of July 1918, 
um, approximately three or four months before the end of World War I, he was executed along with the whole of his family. And the story of the execution of his daughters is particularly sad. They were wearing diamond at the time, diamond jewelry. The bullets bounced off them, therefore, and then they were bayoneted, and then they were shot. And it's an extremely um, tragic and heartrending story. And it is a, a manifest sign to the people of the earth that God still exists, and that God still speaks, and that he spoke to Moses while I'm at him. May the peace and blessings of God be upon him. The most extraordinary part of this, however, is that it wasn't open-ended. It wasn't this is going to happen sometime in the future. The Tsar will die, or the Tsar's empire will be dethroned. He stated, if God Almighty holds back this great calamity, the maximum period will respite will be 16 years from 1905 when he made the prophecy. In any case, it will not be more than 16 years. And this was in the appendix, the Mima means the appendix of the book Brahim Ahmadiyya, volume 5. And he was taught the prayer by God, O oh God, do not let me see the earthquake of the appointed day, which means that this great calamity. And so he was told that through this prayer that you would die. He died in 1908, he made the prophecy in 1905, and the World War I happened 1914 to 1918. And all aspects of it, that it was a worldwide calamity. If he had just said that it was a worldwide calamity, and no other stipulation had been put forward, that in itself should be enough proof. Because prior to World War I, there had never been a worldwide calamity. But he said further that Israel would be saved, the Jewish people would be helped. He said that the places that would be affected worst would be the most places which had forgotten of God. And he made this terrible and heartrending prophecy about the Tsar of Russia. So these are my last two slides. And I'm actually not doing too badly. It's been about 40 to 45 minutes, which was my aim. So thank you very patiently with me. Um, my invitation to atheists in general is this. Why are people atheists? This is a question that all atheists have to ask themselves. Why do they not believe in God? Invariably, it's not because they have found proof that God doesn't exist, because there's no proof that God doesn't exist. It's actually because they haven't found any proof that God does exist. Now, necessarily, to find out whether God exists, though, you have to appoint and you have to take the route by which other people say they have found that God exists. If, for example, I want to measure the, 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 the width of this table and I have tape measure, and I measure it and it's 40 centimetres, and you come along and say, no, it's not 40 centimetres, you're wrong. And I say, I give you the tape measure, I say, well, you've got to check it with the same tape measure I use, you've got to use the same method. That's only fair, right? If they then refuse to use a tape measure and say, no, I don't want to use tape measure, but I know you're definitely wrong. What is that? That's illogicality. And that's actually prejudice, fundamentally. That's having a preconceived bias that the person's wrong, and not willing to undertake the experiment which would result in the conclusion. So if the hypothesis is that God exists, the experiment is different religions. And different religions state that God exists in a particular different way and the approach to God is different. And each one therefore is like a different experimental method. Christians say you don't have to do good works, fundamentally, to enter heaven. You have to just believe in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Muslims say Jesus didn't die on the cross for your sins. You have to do good works. You have to believe in the concept of the one, one in, 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 in split, unsplitable God. And you have to pray to him and do good works. So these are the different means by which you can attain knowledge of God. So in point of fact, you can actually only rationally be an atheist until actually you've been a theist in every single religion for a sufficiently long period of time to convince yourself that that religion wasn't right. And yet, what is the age at which people are becoming atheists, especially what's called new atheism? The vast majority of people aren't becoming atheists at the age of 75 years old when they've been believers in God for the whole of their lives. They're all becoming atheists at approximately the age of 16, 17 years old, or 18 years old, because it's popular now. And in that period of time, have they had sufficient time to research the existence of God, to dedicatedly pray to God and seek Him? I think we all know the answer to that. And I'd like to, to end on this particular point about Islam. Islam states that God will speak to you, and He will communicate with you directly, if you have faith in God, if you um, base your belief in God in a, as, as a Muslim, as God has set forth in the Quran, and God will make himself manifest to you. And it says, as for those who say, our Lord is Allah, and then are steadfast, in other words, they're patient, and they stay upon that route. The angels descend on them, saying, fear ye not, nor grieve, and rejoice in the garden that was promised to you. We are your friends in this life, and in the next. Now, what is the meaning of angels descending upon people in this life and speaking to them if it is not revelation? 
The Holy Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him in Sahih Bukhari, and this is the last quote I'm going to finish on. Uh, he, this is a beautiful, beautiful, it's called a hadith al-Qudsi, which means a hadith or a narration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which he said was directly revealed to him by God. And he says, Allah says, Allah is the name for the one God, not the, some people have said that, you know, people say it's the moon God or things like this, but of the Arabs, it means the one unsplittable God. Allah says, I am as my servant expects me to be, and I am with him when he remembers me. If he thinks of me, I think of him. If he mentions me in company, I mention him in a better company. When he comes closer to me by a hand span, I come closer to him by an arm's length. If he draws closer to me by an arm's length, I draw closer by the distance of two arm's lengths. If my servant comes to me walking, I go to him running. And what precedes every single action of God in this is human endeavor. And that's the key. If you make no effort towards God, God is self-sufficient of you. God does not need you, and God will not manifest himself to you. You can be skeptical about God. You can say, oh God, and you can pray to God every evening and go, God, I don't know if you exist, but I'm hypothesizing you exist, and I want you to show me that you exist in some way. And if you are steadfast on that, the Holy Quran gives a promise that God will manifest himself to you. Thank you very much for listening. I understand there's going to be a question and answer session now. Um, or a discussion. I don't I, I, I'm just a, a student to be perfectly honest, so I'd rather there be a discussion actually. Um, and there's a there's a microphone to be handed down for taking round. Um, and it's going to be chaired by either Dalha or uh, Ali, of course I know Ali. He'll <laughs> <laughs> come round. He'll come round. May I also say that there's a there's a mailing list at the bottom. We do um, events throughout the year on topics related to all kinds of things, and there's loads of free literature at the back, including Qurans, including more information about what the Ahmadiyya Muslim community stands for, as what we claim is the revival of Islam in the modern day. So please pop your name down, see the email, and uh, but no, you can do it towards the end. You don't need to do it now, but you know, as you like, really. But if you want to do it now. <laughs> Where's Dalha? Somebody has to chair. Majeed, could you chair? Thank you very much. I have a lot of comments and a lot of questions that I have right now. Can I, can I ask you just always make sure that you hold it, everybody hold it to your thing? Because we've got a camera running here as well, so you want to catch all the questions properly. All right. So thank you for this great presentation, excellent examples. I especially appreciate the except from Prophet Muhammad about personal relationship with God. First, I'd like to comment about uh, the Catholic belief, because actually Catholic believes that faith without good work is dead. So we need also good work, uh, not just faith. Uh, it's more of a faith Protestant belief. Um, um, I'd like to quote first the Gospel. Bless our these may, I, may I quickly say, can we have Yep. One comment and one question, so that we can go around, right. and then we can come back to you. Would you all choose one comment and one question, in addition to the Catholic one? All right. Yeah, one. it was just... Uh, no, please. So my, my main comment is that, blessed are these who didn't see but believed. And I really appreciate Russian and logical arguments you gave. Uh, actually, they were also developed by Christian theologians, such as Thomas Aquinas, about the first yes. cause. Yeah. They are very convincing for believers. But if all these arguments were so convincing for everyone, um, everyone would believe also Professor Darwin, uh, Professor uh, Dawkins believe in these facts. So my comment is that no empirical evidence uh, is, um, is sufficient to believe in God. Actually, um, I'd like to know about the Muslim view on faith. Is faith just uh, grace? Is more grace, or rather, uh, we need some empirical proofs. You need some empirical proofs. Empirical you gave, proofs. Yes, yeah, what you yeah. gave about physics. Yeah. So my point is that uh, faith is actually also something personal. 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Grades. Yeah. So um, I don't really understand why so people don't have this. Grades. Yeah. This is this is summarized very beautifully in the Holy Quran. In the very first words of the Holy Quran, in Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. There are two attributes of God mentioned in the very first words of the Quran, and these words precede every single chapter of the Quran, and they are Rahman and Rahim. Now, Rahman means when God bestows a blessing prior to you even knowing you had a need for that blessing. So, for example, the existence of the sun, the existence of the moon, your entire ecosystem, your parents, the fact that you're healthy, you did nothing to uh, deserve any of these blessings, right? And yet, they were all given to you as a grace. Part of this is also your faculty of intelligence, your faculty of reflection, right? And your faculty to understand the world around you and derive conclusions from it. And this is where grace is. And this is what Muslims believe in, in this concept of grace. That God has given you all these without you even asking or before you even know, knew you had a need for them. The next attribute mentioned is Rahim. Now Rahim is specific only to those people who believe in God and make, and make an action towards God. Which is why my talk was split into those that God should exist according to what we see in the universe. But the, that God does exist is dependent upon human endeavor towards God. And then God will manifest himself to you. So Rahim, or the, what is known as the mercy of God, is entirely dependent upon a man moving towards God, a man or woman moving towards God, or even a child, really. And then God will come to him. And there's a beautiful verse of the Quran which perfectly answers your question. Because your question fundamentally is asking what is the difference between science and religion in a way. No, I'm just saying that it's not enough just you gave a rational answer yeah, yeah. uh, about science and the universe, but for non-universe it's not yeah. enough. It's they, they will be so sure. skeptical. But the question is, yeah, that's fine. The, the point is, in this particular verse, it says, eyes cannot, God speaking about himself says, eyes cannot reach him, but he reaches the eyes, and he is the incomprehensible, the all aware. Now, it actually delineates the difference between, in a way, science and religion, and answers your question as to why do non-believers require verifiable proof, and where can they get that? It says, eyes cannot reach him. Science is the observation of things with our own eyes, but it says, he reaches the eyes. And then it says he is the incomprehensible, the all aware. Eyes cannot reach him because he's incomprehensible, which is the first attribute you've mentioned, but he reaches the eyes because he is all aware of who is seeking him. So the reason people like Professor Dawkins and other atheists don't believe in the existence of God isn't because there's a lack of proof of God, but it's because God is self-sufficient of Professor Dawkins. God doesn't need to show Professor Dawkins. God doesn't need God, Professor Dawkins to believe in him. If Professor Dawkins doesn't want to believe in God and doesn't want to read the blessings of believing in God, then that's up to Professor Dawkins. And that is fundamentally what free will is. But what God says is, if you want to know me, if you want to read the blessings of knowing me, and I have filled heaven and earth with signs that I exist. Or revelation. Or, revelation. or indeed revelation, right? That indicates that God may exist or does exist. Then if you then on the basis of that make an effort towards me, then, then I will reveal myself to you. And, you know, people speak about God as if he should just be a test tube that you shake and you see a colour change. And this is a total absurdity. I'm a medical student. It's taken me six years to get to where I am, where I'm about to graduate. Do people really think that knowing whether God exists is harder or easier than just obtaining a medical degree? And takes the same amount of time that you should just become an atheist at the age of 18 after just perusing religion, going, ah, oh, you know what, it's a, it's a load of nonsense? It's far more, it's, it re requires effort and it requires caring about your own spiritual co uh, self. And that requires a degree of hypothesis and requires effort on the basis of belief. And I thank you for that mention regarding the Catholic faith, because obviously there are differences within Christianity. And there are... Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting, Kai. Um, If God reveals himself to somebody, uh, what benefits does that have for the person? Because like there are millions of believers and um, a lot of them are very poor or die very early. Some children who might believe or something, they die. Um, yeah. So like, what does God do for you? Yeah. So fundamentally, what God does for you, it relates to two ways. Um, it relates to, first of all, in the belief in God, in actual fact, so your question is, what, does, what, what benefit does belief in God make for people? 
So in actual fact, to say that they, they're poor and they're believers in God and so on and so forth, you see, the concept of suffering is something that you've just brought up as to why does suffering exist in the world if God exists? And what benefit does he do? Surely he should save all believers from any kind of suffering. Now, this is actually a fallacy because God speaks of this in the Holy Quran. He says, um, I think it's at the beginning of a chapter called Surat al-Mulk, but I, I may have to check that. He says, I have created death and life that I may try... God, he is, he, speak, God speaking of himself in the third person says, He has created death and life that he may try you which of you is best in deeds, and he is the mighty, the most forgiving. So what this means is, is that the two poles, the opposite poles with, which, within which suffering exists, death and life, right? Every human being is trying to move away from death and trying to move towards life. They're trying to prevent their losses, and they're trying to gain longer life, or, or things which will provide an abundance of provisions. And God says in this that I have provided these two poles so that I may try you. And in point of fact, just because a person is a believer in God, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, God will stop trying them. In actual fact, there's a verse of the Quran that relates to this, and it says, do the people think that they, they will be left alone because they say they believe, and they shall not be tried? It says, no, surely they shall be tried as their forefathers were tried. I'm paraphrasing, but that is almost exactly what it says. And it points out the fact that belief which is upon the lip is meaningless. Belief is actually that which informs the heart. And this is why the last quote of the Quran I mentioned was that the people said, it says, on the, the revelation is given to those who say, our Lord is Allah, the one God, but you can't say God if you want, it doesn't matter. Our Lord is Allah, and then are steadfast. Steadfast means that no matter what calamity should befall them, they continue to believe and make progress towards God. And this is in actual fact the, the attitude which proves your belief in God. Because a person who believes in God in the morning has a calamity in the afternoon and decides, you know what, God doesn't exist. He didn't believe in the morning. He believed for his own benefit. But he didn't believe because he knew God. And so suffering will continue to betide and to continue to befall people who believe in God. In point of fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that God, um, that God afflicts, a if God intends to do good to somebody, he afflicts him with trials. Now what is the point of afflicting somebody with trials if, God, if that person believes in God? The reason is, is because like iron, which is hidden under dust, when it is burnished, it burns, br burns brighter. And a person's qualities which are latent in relation to the, their belief in God only shine forth when in actual fact there's a trial at hand. So for example, if you go through a calamity or you lose a loved one, and another person with weaker faith could say, you know what, I prayed so hard, God didn't listen to my prayers, and therefore he doesn't exist. But a person who truly loves God more than he loves his relations, and, more than, and he values his connection with God more than he values his connection with other human beings, when he loses a human being, he will say what is said in the Holy Quran that believers say on, on any loss. They say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we belong, and to him shall we return. In other words, they prioritize their faith and their belief in God above all others. The other aspect of this, that's in relation to this world, the other aspect of this is also in relation to the afterlife. Now, if everybody suffers, and if there is a day of reckoning on which all, all those who have been suffering will be recompensed and will be given compensation for that, and all those who inflicted suffering, they will be asked about that and they will be questioned regarding that, then in actual fact that means that there will be a leveling of morality. Not a leveling of morality, there will be a, the objectification and ob objective morality will be settled upon that day. Without belief in that in actual fact, your life in actual fact has no meaning in terms of what is right and what is wrong. Because what, it, what right and wrong becomes without an objective perspective is that this is right for me and this is wrong for me. It doesn't necessarily mean it is right for everybody or it is right or wrong for everybody. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was very surreal. Thank you. I've got a question. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Um, I, I know you, um, Dari, you're a very strong believer. And I'm alright. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far. <laughs> um, could you perhaps um, share um, a personal experience? No. <laughs> <laughs> give a testimony. No. <laughs> I do not need to give testimony. Uh, because God has given his own testimony in the Holy Quran with signs. And the promised Messiah, who was appointed by God to give testimony, um, 
has, has given his testimony. At the end of the day, I've got nothing which can show that God exists more than a person saying that the Tsar of Russia from 1905 will, will be abdicated, will be in a pitiable condition within 16 years but after my death. I've got no testimony better than that. And these are all verifiable in books that are written in English and translated. So they're freely available. So, um, my apologies. Maybe in private we can have a chat, but not, yeah, not on the camera at any moment. Apply some water, just some easy. Um, so, this is referring back to the gentleman's question before, um, which he asked, What benefit do you, does God kind of give you if you have? Belief in him, and I, I think that'd be quite good if you could cover that. Ah, okay. Sorry, that's fine. So, what? So going. So you're highlighting a point that I perhaps didn't cover, right? Okay. So what benefit could um, belief in God give to you? First of all, it gives you peace of mind. In actual fact, it gives you peace of mind because something that mirrors all our math and peace and blessings of God be upon it, as the founder of the Act of the Muslim community said, he said, if a person has a priceless treasure in their hand, does he care about the loss of a few, few pennies? And the answer is no. And so in actual fact, it puts things in perspective for you. Because it means that God is always with you. And when, when you have a being who you know personally, and who knows you personally, and whom you know as a certainty, in actual fact, who is taking care of you, then even if you experience losses along the way, in actual fact, they are meaningless losses in respect to the treasure that you found. So the most important thing actually is peace of mind, um, I would say, from my own, if you want to say, personal experience. Um, the other things are that your prayers will be answered and that you will see the fulfillment of your, of, your, of your prayers when you pray to God and you will see a living relationship with God. It will not be a relationship which is just found in the books that, oh, well, God used to do this for this prophet and he used to do this for this holy man. But you will witness that in your own life. And that will be a source of immense comfort, fundamentally. Again, if anybody has any other additional points, I'm happy for them to speak. Uh, this is not a question and answer session. This is a, a discussion in which I get to answer first. <laughs> okay, my question is, um, you mentioned that um, there is free will, right? Sure. Um, and so, but then God is all knowing, yeah. right? So that means He knows um, every, you know, what we our thoughts and um, what's going to happen at the very end. Who's going to be in heaven or hell, or yeah? Um, so my question is, um, oh, and also you also mentioned that you know prayer is very important because it's communication with God, right? Yeah. So if if in a, in a way God is all knowing, He knows who's going where, and yeah. He knows your next decisions and everything, why do we still need to pray? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it's something that's been a conundrum for philosophers and theists for a very long time. It was answered very, very, very succinctly and beautifully by the fourth Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, whose name was Mirza Tahir Ahmed, who was on the slide about entropy, do you remember? Um, and uh, he is a particular audio link I can send you, but I can tell you what he said as well. But if you pop your email down, we can send it to you. That was just for me to get that in. Um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Yogurt. Yogurt, okay, so you had yogurt. In English, we say yogurt. Uh, <laughs> uh, my apologies, my apologies. I was actually born in New York, but nevertheless. Um, uh, you had yogurt for breakfast this morning. Does the fact that you had yogurt for breakfast this morning and your knowledge of the fact that you had brought yogurt for breakfast this morning, does this change the fact that you made a decision to have yogurt for breakfast this morning? No. Well, God's knowledge of the future is the same as your knowledge of the past. Okay? It is his knowledge in respect of your decision. And he has given you permission and he has given you uh, the power to make, it, make uh, the decision. Just because you know what, he's going, what you're going to do, doesn't take away from the fact that you decide to do it. In point of fact, my mother knows a lot of the time what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest with you. She knows that if I'm going to, I'm going to say this, or I'm going to do this. And I once really annoyed her in the car in the morning going to school by predicting everything she was going to say before she said it. Does it change the fact that she decided to say it? Of course not. Her free will was still in operation. 
And so God's knowledge is, 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 is in a way, takes into accommodation your free will. And so God knows whether you're going to pray to him, but it still requires you to pray to him. It doesn't change that fact that he has set a law, that he is self-sufficient of you, and that he requires you to address him and to demonstrate your dependency. And this is one of the reasons why God in actual fact says, when I desire to do good to somebody, I afflict them with hardship. It is because it is when people are afflicted with hardship and all of the things they depended upon in their life, their family, their friends, their money, when it's all taken away from them and they've got nothing left, and even their own selves are insufficient to bring them out of the problem, then they go, oh God, you know, please help me. And you know, as they say, there's a famous, um, there's a famous quote that I've heard Professor Dawkins absolutely hates, and I really hope he's watching this on YouTube right now, <laughs> is uh, he says he hates this particular quote, which is that there's no atheist in a foxhole. Because when a person falls in a foxhole and they got nothing to help them, they go, oh God, please help me. <laughs> so, so people are still dependent upon prayer. Um, but just because God knows whether you're going to pray or not is, is, is irrespective of the fact that you made that decision. Does that answer my, your question? As regard heaven and hell, I will also say this, that in Islam there is the misconception, even among Muslims, that hell is eternal. Right? In Christianity there is the belief, and I, if you can correct me there, obviously there are differences with, between Christians. Individual Christians have different beliefs as well. But in the generality, especially among Protestant Christianity, there is the belief that hell is eternal. Among a lot of Muslims, there is the belief that hell is eternal. But if you would like, we can talk about the verses of the Quran that specifically say that hell is not eternal, and the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that people will leave hell and enter heaven. And the reason for that is this, is that God, fundamentally, even hell, is about progress towards God. When, you want to, when a judge wants to inflict a reformation on somebody, sometimes they give them community service or they give them a, a, you know, a project whereby they can reform themselves in a positive way. Other times they send them to jail. Both are with the aspect of reformation. Right? So this is the same with God as well. So in the Quran, I'll end with this. God says, my mercy encompasses all things. And all things, obviously, also <coughs> means all things. I remember you had a few more questions, didn't you? So one more. One more. Okay. Well, we can come back to these. Um, if you want to find out about the existence of God, you mentioned prayer as the principal means. How should one pray? And is there anything else you can do alongside the prayer? Sure. Okay. Well, that's a very, very good question, actually. How should one pray? So the first thing is that the Quran says it is at the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun, which is the it's the chapter called the Believers. It begins with the words six. Um, Okay, I'm not going to try the Arabic, I'm going to wrong. It says, successful indeed are the believers who are humble in their prayers. The very first thing that it states as the mark of a successful believer who will result in knowledge of God is humility. And because humility is in a way, it draws the mercy of God. Now, for this purpose, this is why in, in, in Islam, we're taught the different prostrations and the different positions. It is because your posture will naturally inform your character and your emotions and your mindset. So, for example, I, I used to act as a, a, in my school plays and things. And if you act really extravagantly and boastfully and you push your chest out and you walk with your head held high, it induces a feeling of vainglory. It induces a feeling of arrogance. And if you walk in a humble attire, in a humble position, it induces a feeling of humility. And so this discloses a curious relationship between the soul and the body. That when the body therefore prostrates, as in the Muslim prayer, the soul will also prostrate. And that is the reason why Islamic movements, Islamic movements contain every aspect of humility. You stand like this, you bow, you stand up straight as if before a ruler, you prostrate, you kneel. And so it is an amalgamation of all of those things. So whether you believe you're a Muslim or not, in a way it's irrelevant, but the principle still stands, that you should adopt a position of humility physically when speaking to God. Sorry, I don't know why I'm shaking a little bit, I think I'm a little bit nervous. Um, you should adopt a position of humility when speaking of God, uh, when speaking to God. And also the Quran also gives us the perfect prayer, which is the opening chapter of the Holy Quran. And it is a model prayer for all Muslims and non-Muslims. And anybody who wants to have a model prayer and wants to try this as an experiment, does God exist? For two years, I'm going to read this chapter before I go to bed every evening with heartfelt thing. It will only take you one minute an evening. One minute an evening to find out if God exists. 
I mean, you know, that is better than a medical degree, I've got to tell you. That's a lot. I'll put in a lot more hours in one minute in the evening, I tell you. But there's another thing you should do along with prayer. I'm just going to briefly mention about this particular prayer. It begins with the attributes of God. So it says, Alhamdulillah um, Rabbil Alameen. All praise belongs to Allah. In other words, all beautiful and praiseworthy things you see are the exclusive attribute and are only reflective of God's praiseworthiness. Right? So it begins with a statement which immediately appeals your heart. Because whatever you love in life, you should realize that the only reason you love that beautiful thing is because actually its beauty belongs to God. And so it continues and it says, Rahman and Rahim, the one who bestows before your action and the one who bestows after your action, and the Maliki or Middin, the one who will take into account and will, will be the master of the day of judgment, of reckoning. And so, and then, it, and then it, you go on to your own particular question, then it says, Thee alone do we worship, thee alone do we implore for help. So it's only halfway through the prayer that the individual is brought in. And so it teaches us that you should first address God in terms of his attributes. And this is what the Quran says, it says, call upon by his attributes, any of his attributes, and that his, his, his names are the most beautiful. Right? And you should, the second aspect I would say, is you should address God in his attributes and then address your prayer. And the second thing you should do is, that you should understand, you should do so with humility in your physical and mental attitude. And finally, that you should, um, rather penultimately, uh, that you should um, address God in the most superlative terms. Do not say to God, please God, give me an adequate car. Never say that. Never make that prayer. You should always pray to God and say, God, give me the best car. You should. Because God is not, God is not a miser. God is not uh, incompetent that he can't give you the best car. So why should you expect something of God that in actual fact is below actually what God can actually do? You should expect God to give you everything you need. And the promised Messiah, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who is the reformer of Islam, and I would advise every single person here in this room to forget about what you may have heard about him and to objectively go and research him and read his books firsthand with first-hand knowledge and make a judgment for yourself. He said, if you need to even pray, even if you need a shoelace in life, you should pray for it. Right? The second aspect of it is that you should do good deeds. Because something which is just by your lips and by your word and mouth has much less benefit and much less kind of force behind it and conviction than when you're actually doing a good deed. And even if that is one P in a box a day, that could be your good deed for the day. That is sufficient. What, is, what needs to be shown is that you're making an effort towards God. One P towards charity. One P towards charity, what did I say? You said one P. <laughs> one P, yeah, one P towards charity a day. Even if it's that small, but you should make it a daily thing. And it should not be I did it once, I did it twice, it should be a daily thing. And your prayers should be daily as well. So what sort of response could you expect? Okay, that's a good question. Um, what, what sort of response could you expect? Well, the Holy Quran speaks about this. It talks about the different um, modes by which God might communicate with the person. The first way is that often people pray to God, often not knowing how God might communicate with them. And so they say, I know one person, for example, who was who coming, coming towards Islam and he said to God, while he was cooking, he was cooking in his kitchen, and he said, oh God, this is a friend of mine actually, he lives down the road from where I live with my parents. He said, oh God, if you exist, then cause me to, uh, and he couldn't think of anything, and he said, cause me to leave the gas on in the kitchen. It's probably no, not the wisest sign you get ever ask, but he left the gas on three times that day. And he chose that particular thing because he thought to himself, there's no way I'm going to leave the gas on. So if I leave the gas on, God's got to exist. And then it happened three times and he thought to himself, you know what, well, that might just be coincidence. And then he prayed to God a little bit more and he was showing more things. But the point is, you could ask for a sign. Like if you go to a body and you want to know if it's alive, you say blink five times, that's a sign. Or if you speak to it and you want a response, then that person speaks to you. Now the lowest level of speak God speaking to a person is according to all religious literature, whether it be the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the um, Guru Granth Sahib, the Holy Quran, the lowest form is a true dream. What I mean by a true dream, everybody dreams every evening, and usually they're, they're dreams that, you know, oh, I'm hungry, I'm eating a big meal or something. But once in a while you get a dream which tells you about something that's going to happen, or it informs you regarding something um, that you was unknown to you. And the hallmark of God is that he knows the future. And this is his particular attribute, because he is the knower of the unseen and the seen, it says in the Quran. 
This is the particular attribute that God says is my hallmark of communication. That I tell you something which you didn't know and which you couldn't have known. And that is a sign. It's not direct proof yet. The highest form is when God addresses you with words. And people should not think that that is not possible today. The members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community who follow Mirza Ghulam Ahmad themselves, peace be upon him, many among them who you may walk past in the mosque are people with whom God has spoken in words. And you can go and you can ask them, you can make investigation into this, but I can tell you as a fact that this is the case. And this is the blessing that is dependent upon the person following, the, the individual who is appointed as the guide for this particular age. So I hope that kind of answers the question. The lowest form is true dreams or a sign, the highest form is verbal revelation. But to get there, it is, it's not going to, you know, you need to put in effort at the end of the day. It's not a, it's not a fact. Uh, how can you say it's a fact unless you've, you've been in the head of that person? Like, he is very true. You, yeah, that's absolutely true. It's not a fact, but what I'm saying is it's a fact that they... You, you, you no? believe that, the, that he says the right thing, it's testimony? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a fact for that individual, is what I mean. That if you were to become an Ahmadi Muslim, and you were to strive in the way of God, then God may speak to you. And you may, and then when you have that experience yourself, then you will know that God exists. But to be an atheist prior to undertaking that route, what is the meaning of that atheism? It's effectively atheism because you just regard it as, as extraordinary, you call it outside the bounds of possibility. But as I said, is a flying fish outside the bounds of possibility? To, to, a, to a person who lived in the 15th century, the idea of the Big Bang, or the idea of extraterrestrial life, which we are now seeking, was the idea of science fiction. It was not even the idea of science fiction, it wasn't even in the realm of them even thinking about it. And yet now we're thinking about it and using billions of dollars to actually find out through telescopes whether that actually extraterrestrial life exists. So you should depend actually upon honesty of purpose in the sense, I'm not saying you're dishonest, but I mean is honesty of putting aside your <coughs> concepts and your prejudices or your biases and actually undertaking action. Which is what I'm saying. But what about your theists? I think we've got a question here. Can I, can I come back to you? I'll come back to you, is that all right? Because we've got the microphone here, somebody's been waiting. Um, all right, all right. I was going to, can you yeah. speak into the microphone? Yeah, I was going to ask a slightly different question of this gentleman. You know, he, he, I mean, it's, I think, did we establish that at the end of the day, all facts, or 99.9% .9 of all facts, is based on testimony? So if somebody at the end of the day, when we say that this, you know, it's an actual fact that people have re verbal revelation, it's yes. obviously based upon testimony, okay? Because that's how we know the vast majority of facts. Yeah, I mean, how, have you ever been to Andorra? No, you know Andorra exists because you've heard of it through through testimony. Uh, well, if you go that way, like you can't even say if anything exists behind me. Or I, I, like, that's absolutely right. It is. That's absolutely right. Yeah, but that is, mm. So you believe in God? No. Okay. That's fine. That's fair enough. That's fine. Okay, if I can just ask my question, which is in relation to the the idea that you have a multiverse. And as a result of which, that actually somehow is a substitute for God. I find extremely ext uh, extraordinary. And the reason is because if you don't believe that there is a God who actually initiated at least this universe, then essentially you, you're talking about a multiverse, and you're talking about and that the entire multiverse system has essentially existed forever, you know, in infinity. And if it's been in existing in infinity, that means that we shouldn't actually exist. Yeah. Right. So, in fact, the multiverse doesn't actually solve that, that issue. And I think perhaps you might want to just explain what I mean by, by, by saying at the end of the day, if infinity goes back, infinity backwards, yeah. essentially today never comes because it's infinity plus one. Yeah, well, that's, well, I don't think I need to explain it. I mean, you've just explained it. Well, I mean, it's the concept of infinite regression. That if, for example, I'm always, I'm, I'm, if infinity is an infinite amount of time in the past, and they are always traveling towards somewhere, you're never going to reach any destination because you're always going to be infinitely back in the past. So why so, how does the multiverse actually... Well, the multiverse, they say, is that they, it doesn't relate to eternity. The multiverse is not in relation to whether there's something which is eternal. The multiverse, as I said, people are generally accepting that something has to be eternal. Some cosmologists say that time is a, the movement of time and the illusion of time progressing is an illusion. And actually everything is existing simultaneously. It's called the B theory of time, right? So they accept that the, the universe is eternal that we live in. 
Other, you know, other courts of cosmologists like Lawrence Krauss say that the quantum mechanic laws are eternal. But the Holy Quran actually gives a beautiful answer to this. It says in the particular verse of the Quran called the, the verse of the throne, which is the, it manifests and demonstrates those attributes of God which in a way are transcendent and are the prerogative of God alone. It says, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyu al qayyum. It says, Allah, Allah is He besides whom else there is no other God. And He is the living and the self subsisting and all sustaining. It indicates that to be the living one for eternity, it is immediately followed on by the self subsisting and all sustaining. To be living for eternity effectively means that you actually have to sustain yourself. Because otherwise, in what way are you living? And in what way could you exist throughout eternity? Unless, in actual fact, you were self existing. So, the laws of quantum mechanics, for example, saying that's eternal is a meaningless statement. Because one, who arranged the laws of quantum mechanics? If you say the laws of quantum mechanics arrange themselves, then that means that the laws of quantum mechanics were conscious, in which case God does exist. He's called quantum mechanics. You see? So, for there to be a self sustaining aspect to it, which is necessary to be eternal, it is necessary that that thing be conscious of itself, to be self-sustaining. So the multiverse addresses the issue of fine-tuning, that the universe is so perfectly fine-tuned that, in point of fact, um, we have to explain this by saying we are just one of the infinite, I mean, 10 to the power of 120 is a very large number. You know, it's a huge, huge number. Um, it just shows, actually, it's a, it's a meaningless statement to believe in the multiverse, actually. You either believe in this universe or um, you don't believe in this universe and you believe we're all a figment of our own imaginations. Thanks. Um, it was, uh, there was a topic about... Oh, sorry, sorry, one second. I think we're going to leave it for another 15 minutes and then maybe start wrapping up. But I just wanted to put that up. Yes, there was a question about how... Uh, um, probably we are uh, like we agree that God is merciful, but cannot disrespect someone's decision to leave him. Yeah. So hell is basically beyond time, beyond any dimensions, and that's why uh, we can take decisions before our death, but after our death, we are just beyond time. So what we can do, the only thing we can do is to offer ourselves to God and His mercy before death. This is the Catholic teaching, probably yeah. very similar to Muslim yeah. uh, mainstream. Um, my question is about the relationship between science and faith, because we are basically talking about science tonight. Uh, personally, did you discover your faith mainly from science or rather from testimonies, as you said, revelation? Because it's fascinating to know what Muslims think about uh, this relationship between science and reason, uh, sorry, reason and faith. Uh, for example, in Catholic teaching, there is um, a very uh, beautiful quote from the Incipient uh, John Paul II, saying that. Faith and reason are two wings of human searching of God. This yeah. uh, the answer being faith and reason. It's a very famous one, and um, it explains basically the relationship between reason and faith in our uh, mainstream uh, opinion, our uh, public opinion. Many think, people think that uh, faith contradicts science, yeah. but it's not true. They yeah. they fulfill each other. So yeah. my my question is about Muslim view on on this topic. Thank you. Yeah. So the Muslim view on this topic is very similar to, to what you've just described. And it's, it was really well elucidated by Naveed Malik, the uh, president of the AMRA, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Research Association, when he quoted um, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community who said that science is the act of God and religion is the word of God. Now every single individual likes to keep their actions and their words relatively constant. And if a person acts in a particular way in which they speak not, or they say that they do something when they don't do it, we call them a hypocrite. Right? Now, we cannot accuse God of that because God is the possessor of the absolute of all good qualities. And we can go into the why is God good. We can go into that. I'm perfectly happy to talk about that if somebody wants to raise that. Um, so, God's actions and his words must be constant. So, if we find a discrepancy between God's actions and his words, it means we have failed to understand one or the other. Right? And often what happens is, unfortunately, the, the problem is twofold as to why there's this concept of faith. I'm glad you all heard me both. Uh, why is there this concept um, that faith is in a way and contradictory to science? This is the fault both of atheists and many theists, in actual fact. It's the theists' fault because often what they do is they take verses of their holy scriptures, which are allegorical, and they translate them in a manner which is literal. Right? Now, the Holy Quran actually answers this question as well, very beautifully in the chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 of the Holy Quran. It says, in this book, there are two types of verses. 
there are verses that are mukam and mutashabihat. Mukam means verses that are obvious in meaning and clear and decisive. And mutashabihat means verses that are allegorical or metaphorical. And it says you have to interpret the allegorical or metaphorical in consonance with that which is obvious. You can't take an obvious thing and subject it to your particular interpretation of a metaphorical verse. And that is what is called, the Quran condemns and says, those who are perverse at heart pursue such thereof as are allegorical. But those who are rasik or nafil they are those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, they say the whole of it is from our Lord. In other words, they look at the whole picture together. So this is the fault of many theists because they take an allegorical verse of the Quran, right? And they say that that actually happens. So for example, there's a community among Muslims, especially in the 19th century, and this resulted in big riots across the Indian subcontinent over two groups of Muslims, because it says in the Holy Quran that Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, right? And it calls the, it calls the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Siraj Munir, the, uh, the radiant lamp. So what they said was, because the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran is called the radiant lamp, they said if he was a radiant lamp, then he couldn't have had a shadow, right? And there was a group of Muslims that said he had a shadow, and there was a group of Muslims who said he didn't have a shadow, and there were riots about this. I kid you not. So what the point being made is that people take something which is evidently allegorical, which is in contradiction of another verse that says, the you know, the Prophet Muhammad said, was told to say, I am but a man like yourselves, at the end of the chapter called al Ghat, the cave. It says, say, I am but a man like yourselves. Now that's a very clear, obvious thing. So obviously when you say, call somebody a radiant lamp, it doesn't mean he actually didn't have a shadow because he was always emitting light, did it? So in a way, this is the fault of theists in this way. The fault of atheists, is in that they take that aspect of what some theists behave like and they blow it out of proportion. Way beyond actually which most believers in God. Most believers in God believe in science. That's a fact. You know, the vast majority of people of any religion, they are scientists, they're professors, they're of all kinds. And some of the top, uh, for example, Abdus Salam, who is the, the first Nobel laureate of physics, uh, first Nobel laureate of physics, the first Muslim Nobel laureate of any kind, um, in science, sorry, in science, he was an Ahmadi Muslim. And he was a staunch believer in God. And there have been, as you know, many Catholic Nobel laureates as well. So I think this is a fault of both. But as I said, it's, you know, the, it's because there is no contradiction between the word of God and the act of God. And it's up to us to chalk our path through that. Sure, we'll, we'll see how many, yeah. Did you have a question? It's all right. You sure? Yeah, no, You live in my flat, so I can tell you That's why it's all brief for man. Go on, could you take the microphone, please? Because oh, I want to yeah. pick up on camera. Oh, it's not too far. It's a lamp. Um, oh, I don't understand my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and remove the Birmingham accent. It's fine. Uh, so but, so you could, you, could you please speak into it? We've got a camera as well. Right. If we look at the ideas spatially and temporally, yeah. So, for example, I know in the modern day there's like very little case that no one has had contact with your form of religion or any form of religion which is meant to be from the one true power. However, there are there will be still a few very remote villages that have never come to contact with yeah. said religion, and also we look. Temporally, so in the past, of you yeah. villages who have never even heard of this form of religion. Yeah. So, my question would be then, how do these people function in the afterlife? And what, what yeah. do they go when they say, yeah. "Well, I never heard anything about this." Yeah. If if it has been influenced so far up until yeah. this point, then where do these people lie? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, the Islamic position is completely sound on this, and this is one of the beauties of Islam, is that it's a perfectly universal religion. The Holy Quran says, there is no people to whom a warner has not been sent, or a prophet has not been sent. And it says, among every people we have raised a messenger of their own language, right? And there's a chapter called Hud, for example, in which the prophets are continually talked about, about how each prophet came from among the people from whom they were sent, to whom they were sent to preach. And the teaching of Islam is that Islam is about 1,500 years old now. But the teaching of Islam is that it is incumbent upon a Muslim. And to be a Muslim, to call yourself a Muslim, you have to believe that God sent a prophet and a message to all peoples of all times and all geographic locations. 
Now, what happens to those messages is that they become degenerated. And naturally, the pure unity of God degenerates into idolatry and polytheism, which is like what we hear now of the Greek civilization and beliefs is belief in many gods. What we hear now of the Nordic gods is that they believed in many gods. But in actual fact, the Islamic position is that they all believed in one God in the beginning. <coughs> and they split up the attributes of God. So the one attribute of God is the forgiving. So they, they make one particular God, and they give him a name of the forgiving. And so they would embody the attribute of God as a different God. Now, what we believe happened with Christianity is that we believe the same thing happened, but because there was a very strong Jewish tradition, there was still the concept of the unity of God. And so they tried, in our belief, and obviously our Christian brothers can disagree, feel free to disagree with us, but they tried to combine three gods in one. And one is, guess what? One is very forgiving, one is very vengeful, and the third is fairly ambiguous. But the, the, the point is, the Christians would say that they all, in actual fact, are the same God. But that's because of their very strong Jewish tradition. Um, but in actual fact, we believe that therefore every people have had a messenger, every people have had a prophet. And the Holy Quran says that to every people we have sent a messenger with the same message. Believe ye in the one God and shun the evil one. This is the basic message of every single religion. And so, in actual fact, when we find that, you know, the Hindus have a religion and this people have, it actually confirms our belief. And so each people will be judged according to the message they receive. And if, for example, there are pygmies in South America, for example, currently, right, who, they, they live in the wilderness, they, they have no association with other people, when they die and they go to God, God will judge them. Either if no message has reached them, God will judge them according to the law that he has given them, and that is human conscience. And so everybody will be called to account on the basis of something. Do you see? Then what about um, people who weren't such what God they have highly, as we would view... Um, so people who... Have highly, sort of, as we would view today, sort of barbaric traditions. For example, Mongolians yeah. would have, um, during the, after the... What was the cooling period? Well, during the cooling period after the... Um, so like Genghis Khan when they yeah, raped and pillaged huge numbers of people. And they were essentially viewed as sort of heroes within their own communities. Within, yeah. that, within that nomadic community. Yeah. How would then they be judged? Well, they would be judged by, by the conscience that God gave them. Naturally, they knew what they were doing was wrong. I mean, I don't think... Would, they, would they naturally know it was wrong? Yes, this is what the Holy Quran states. Okay, so that's... Okay, so yeah, just God says... God says, we have revealed, we, we, in relation to this human soul, it says, we reveal to it what is wrong for it, what is right, what is wrong for it, and what is right for it. Right? And every human soul can te testifies as to what is right and what is wrong. And so every human soul knows that. And that is, the, in a way, the clincher of the argument. Because God has given that to everybody as an argument to them as individuals, that even if no message has reached you, I put a message inside you that you should have known about, and that you should have acted. Which is why people who don't believe in God, they yet feel compelled to, to invent a new form of ethics, which is called humanism. And why is that? Why is it that if there's no objective morality, you should do good to people? Their very own condition that they believe in humanism actually testifies to an objective determinator of morality. Because otherwise, there should actually be also be an atheistic movement, rationally speaking, which should advocate evil towards other people. There is. <laughs> What's that? What's that? No, it's, it's versions of Satanism where they don't believe. But Satanism is still believing where, in God. Where they don't believe in Satan itself. They're defunct of Satanism. Well, I'm not going to go particularly into intricate class. We're talking about mainstream kind of people who are atheists in today's world. Is that the vast majority? You won't find a website for you know British British evil society. You find British humanist society. You don't find British Satanist society. No, so, sorry. Can I ask a question to you? Do they actually believe that they should kill and murder and and each other and take their property. Well, I don't know personally. I'm sorry. Know. I don't know. I, I, so, do you see what personally? You... I think we should we should debunk all forms of past pretext and thought that will essentially hamper our own visions of thought for the future. So, we should so remove. Should speak into my... We should remove shackles such as atheism and religion, so we can explore our own worlds and our own thoughts. May I may, I, may I answer that or comment upon that? Yeah. That's okay. I mean, how are you supposed to? At the fundamental level, atheism and theism only exist because the reach of human imagination, in a sense, yeah. or human um, uh, concepts, reaches the question as to who created us. Now, if you want to break away from the shackles of atheism and theism, it actually means that you don't want to think about more important things, and don't want to let your mind wander in search of those things. But you can enjoy imagination without thinking about certain aspects of imagination more than others. Why? Why should you? 
But why shouldn't you? That's may hard. You can't say you, you can't, can't like Fred. You can't um, you can't falsify an argument purely through sort of saying why can't you? No, but what I'm saying is, look, at the end of the day, God exists or he doesn't exist, right? Let's get back to the fundamental principle. Well, he might exist. He doesn't, no, no, no. It's not God might exist. God either exists, as a fact, irrespective of our opinion upon the matter, he either exists or he doesn't exist. They either, or there's a form of a creator, or there's a form of something that preceded the Big Bang. Because we, otherwise, if you're going to take that position about the creator, why not take that position about this chair? I do. I'd literally take on everything. <laughs> okay, so you're a complete nihilist. <laughs> okay, well... I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Can we? Okay, there are some comments. Please, yeah, I, could you pass the microphone to me, please? Um, I don't really understand what you're saying, though. It's I understood it like uh, you want to you want to be in a kind of existential vacuum between theism and atheism, so be a kind of agnosticism. No, 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 right? No. So, but uh, apparently, eventually, all people look for some meaning. So, it's a kind of temporary uh, position, I think, existential position. There's a person I, in front of you as well. I'm sorry, I'd just like to sort of clarify this notion of which his position, which is there's no, there's, no legal, there's no society that actually believes that you should actually do evil, right? And you said, yes, there is in terms of Satan. Oh, so, no society, people. Or, or people. Well, I would sort of say to you that's, you know, fundamentally that cannot possibly be true. Because even, for example, thieves, for example, you have a group of thieves who actually uh, go around thieving and burglaring, etc., right? They have a saying in English which says, honor among thieves. In other words, they, don't, they believe that it's okay to go and rob other people outside, but there's no, they're not going to rob each other, right? So at the end of the day, there is still a, a sense of morality, yeah. even among thieves. So there is, in reality, thieves no human being. Sorry. Thieves so what I, my point is this, at the end of the day, in reality, there's no human being who's on this earth who doesn't have a sense of morality within it. Okay. And this, not, this is proved by a very fine philosophical point, and I, I think there's a point here as well that would like to be made. Uh, it's that if a person, for example, believes theory is fine, right, and believes taking other people's property is fine, he's a kleptomaniac, let's say. Now, they still know that stealing is wrong. Mm -hmm. And you know that they know that stealing is wrong is because when they are stealed from, Stop. they feel aggrieved mm -hmm. and they feel annoyed. And so on some level, when it happens to them, they know it's wrong. Now, if they actually knew it to be right and thought it to be right, when they're stolen from, they should throw a party. <laughs> but nobody does that. There's not a single person on earth, I would say, who ever has ever been stolen from and has been happy because he's been stolen from, or his brother has been murdered and he's like, yeah, well, I'm a Satanist, that's really good. Yeah. There's not a single one, and that is a uh, testimony to the concept of an objective. You know, there's not a single person. Can you bring the mic? Sorry. How, how, how are you aware there's not a single person? How am I aware that there's? He, okay. He doesn't then, take pleasure in his own pain. Sadism has got a... Even even sadism is not within the bounds of that because even sadism has a limit beyond which I don't want to go into sadism. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> to be honest, I, I think we're going to leave that. To commit these things that. Um. If there is an afterlife, why don't we throw parties when people die? We do. And In actual fact. Yeah, but people cry, people are sad. Of course. So it doesn't, like, does that have any reason why don't we just let them die? Let them rot somewhere? I mean, it doesn't really matter. Does it? Well, if there's an afterlife, then it does matter. But the, the problem, Muhammad, so what exactly is your question? Could you ask? Why don't we throw a party if people die? Well, yeah, I know that, that there is nice food and stuff like that, and like, <laughs> about the people, but like, um, I mean, why why is there a feeling of being sad when somebody dies? Because, because like we got we're gonna, like got, if, like we have some sense of morality or yeah. something. Like, yeah, something that's a very that's stuff. a very good, that's a very good point. Which is why in Islam it is forbidden to, um, and in fact in all religions it is forbidden to uh, despair. It is forbidden to get to a point in your life whereby just because you've lost somebody, you are thrown into a pit of despair because there is always God and God will take care of that person. And so you're aggrieved because you developed a relationship of love with that person and because in actual fact, the relationship you had with them was in actual fact a, a reflection of the beauty of what the blessings God had put in them and the, the beauty of God's attributes. So even with your love with other human beings, because everything in the universe is a reflection of the attributes of its creator, when you lose something in this universe, in point of fact, actually, is that you've actually lost um, a thing which is a reflection of God. And that is actually the source of your sorrow. It's just that you particularly perceive it in this person. 
Um, so, uh, which is which is why, in a way, if somebody dies who you didn't know and whose qualities you did not experience, you're not aggrieved at all. If you hear of the death of 40 people occurring in a, in a landmine in Chile, right? or in this place, you don't suddenly go into a wailing cry as his as the people's wives did, it's because you didn't know their qualities. And so, in actual fact, what you're grieving is the loss of the qualities that you knew. That's actually what you're grieving. You're not grieving the loss of the individual per se. And so, it's a fine subtle point which indicates that everything in this universe is related to God. And when you lose something, because God still exists, that's why it's forbidden in Islam to wail and to tear your clothes in grief in Islam if somebody dies. I think there was a, there was a question there as well. hope I answered that. Yeah, please. Now I'm pointing to you. No, you, the one with the microphone in your hand. You, you were going to say something. I'm just waiting to you like this. <laughs> Jesus was one of your prophets, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, in Islam, you believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Yeah. And um, he was, in fact, replaced by Judas. Mm. And, um, and then yes, yes, Jesus, I'll, I'll go through, yeah. Yeah, Jesus ended up to heaven. Yeah. My question is, I mean, what... It kind of seems as though God tricked us. Oh, well, I agree with that. Because, <laughs> yeah, because um, then this whole like Christianity sure, sure. formed, and I'm sure thinking, I understand your question. So, how do you believe in that? Is your question? Yeah, and so why did it take so long for God to just finally come down and send an angel? Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree with you. In fact, I could raise a number of objections myself is because the Ahmadiyya Muslim community doesn't believe in that understanding of Jesus. And in point of fact, that's one of the key differences between what one may call mainstream Islam and Ahmadiyya Islam. We would not call, in a sense, we regard ourselves in a natural fact in terms of orthodoxy as more mainstream than anyone else, because we believe, base all of our beliefs principally upon the Holy Quran. Um, other Muslims also claim to base their beliefs upon the Holy Quran, and we may have many debates saying, well, this particular verse, the Holy Quran says this, and so on and so forth. So other Muslims do believe this. So Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims in general. Ahmadi Muslims, we, um, we believe what is stated explicitly in the Holy Quran, not that which is allegorical. So in the Holy Quran, it's explicitly stated in the chapter 3, verse 145, that Ma Muhammad illa rasul laqad khalat min qablihi rasul. Muhammad is only a messenger, verily, that the messengers before him passed away. And when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died, his first successor recited this to everybody, and everybody accepted that all the messengers before Muhammad, peace be upon him, had died. And that included Jesus. And there are up to 30 verses we provide that show that Jesus actually has died a natural death. So the question is, because other Muslims believe he was ascended to heaven and he's still physically alive 2,000 years later. It's similar to the Christian belief, except that they take the ascension and they put it prior to the crucifixion and say he wasn't even put on the cross. Whereas Christians say he was put on the cross, he died, he resurrected, and then he ascended. Now, as Ahmadi Muslims, what we believe is that Jesus was put on the cross because it says in the Holy Quran um, that um, um, in one of the early chapters of the Quran, which means that they did not kill him, nor did they manage to kill him through crucifixion, uh, but it was made to appear as though that was the case. So the question is, what was made to appear as though that was the case? The case was that he was actually put on the cross, we believe, with the intention of killing him. But that actually he appeared dead when he, for example, it says that he gave up the ghost in the Gospels. We believe that actually it means that he stopped breathing because the word uses is pneuma, and pneuma means breath. But we know now in modern science that a person can still be alive if they're not breathing, if their heart is pumping. And this is testified that he was alive by the fact that when the Roman guard cut his side, to find out if he was dead, it says blood and water gushed forth. In another gospel, I think it's Matthew, it says blood and water rushed forth, right? Now the heart, if it's only when the heart's beating that blood can gush out of anything, right? Which indicates he was still alive. So we believe that when he was seen afterwards, alive, and with the wounds in his hand, and he said to Doubting Thomas, place your hand on my side and look here, and so and so forth, 
We believe actually it's because he hadn't died. It wasn't that he died and come back to life. It was that he had actually survived the crucifixion. And we believe that Jesus himself prophesied this and that it was Paul who manipulated the event of the crucifixion so as fundamentally to change the doctrines of Christianity. And that the early Christians known as the Ebionites, who were related to James, for example, who was the first successor of Jesus and the brother of Jesus, that he believed in what we believed. So we believe that Jesus survived the crucifixion in accordance with his own prophecy, which is in uh, the Bible as well. It says that, he says, no sign shall be shown unto an adulterous generation except for the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now the heart of the earth means the sepulchre. Now what therefore was the sign of Jonah? The sign of Jonah was that a person who was, who was in a condition whereby he should have died, he was thrown off a ship in an ocean, he was saved through miraculous circumstances. That's the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah isn't that he died and came back to life. The sign of Jonah is that he was alive throughout the entire ordeal. So the sign that we believe Jesus put forth was actually that no sign shall be given except this one, that I shall have a sign of Jonah, which is that I shall, I shall be kept alive. And his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane the, the night before, saying, Oh, Abba, take this bitter cup of death away from me, not as I will, but as you will, is a testimony to the fact that he didn't want to go on the cross, we believe. And finally, I'll end on this point, and we can discuss this at length afterwards. There's a, there's a wonderful book that the founder of the Akhmadi Muslim community wrote called Jesus in India, right? In which he said that after the crucifixion ordeal, he then went to India in search of the lost tribes of Israel. Because Jesus said, I have not come except unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So this means that his prophet's mission to the lost sheep of the house of Israel would not have been complete had he ascended to heaven after the crucifixion. Right? So, and we know from history that the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who were part of the northern kingdom of Israel, and who were enslaved by the Babylonian king, that they were spread all over India, Tibet, and Kashmir. And the people of Afghanistan today, right, they are of Jewish descent. So many among the, many among the Afghani say that they are from Isachel, or Musachel, or, or Yusufchel, which means the tribe of Jesus, the tribe of Moses, the tribe of uh, Joseph, Suleiman Chel, right, the tribe of Solomon. And there are mountains and, and valleys called after the Jewish prophets. It's because they are dis descended from the Jewish people, and we believe Jesus went and preached to them, and preached to them that he was a prophet, that there was going to come a prophet after him, who would be a Muhammad, and that when he came, he accepted them. But the party who, were, who um, became Christians were the Christians of Rome, among whom Paul spread misinformation, as a Pharisee and as a hypocrite, we believe, uh, who spread misinformation regarding Christianity, and that Christianity was distorted by him, and that modern-day Christianity is not reflective of the early Christians' beliefs. And that when his version was adopted at the Council of Nicaea, that in a way led to an end of what we believe is the true beliefs of Christianity. So I hope that is a very quick summary. Uh, and, uh, so do you have any questions or is that the end? So thank you all for coming. Um, um, thanks for attending. Um, we have a book stand for here in Canada. Um, thanks a lot for coming um, for attending. Um, we have books and brochures uh, at the rear of this room, and um, I believe there's a mailing list going around. Um, if you have any questions regarding today's topic or any other topics, you could email us or um, our website is answer.org.uk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.